May 1994, Judy Ledden and fellow pilot Ben Ashman are preparing for what will prove to be the most demanding, but perhaps the most satisfying journey of their already eventful lives. Both came to flying as hang glider pilots, but now each has turned to flying microlight aircraft. Ben some years ago, but Judy more recently. This coming flight under the banner of Flight for Light has become a passion. It's to be in memory of Yasmin Saudi, a close friend who died only three months previously of lung cancer. Judy came up with the idea of flying from London to Amman, going from England where Yasmin uh, was to her home country in Jordan. And the more we looked at it, the more and more I was sold on the idea. Now, with anxious relatives and friends behind them, thoughts turn to the problems ahead as they make a turn over nearby Blenheim Palace for the cameras and set course for the English Channel. Their 4,000 kilometre flight is planned to take them through 11 countries. It's taken months to plan, yet as they leave, they know that at least one of the necessary permissions has not yet been granted. Uh, Golf Brother, whiskey to Golf Brother Victor. Um, suggest you climb to 1,500 feet. Through the first few hours, all attention is focused on how the aircraft are performing. Ahead lies the 40 kilometre channel crossing, and engine failure here could be catastrophic. What seems to be the problem, Ben? Um, the engine, well, on the intercom, we're just getting a tick, uh, ticking noise. It sounds like something is spilling onto the exhaust pipe. It may be oil. Um, it may be something metal, it may be a strap or something flapping around. The engine's, the engine's running fine. Um, it just, uh, it tends to make you nervous when something like this happens. Okay, let's go to France. I've only crossed the channel once before in a microlight, and that was uh, last year. And the chap that I was flying next to, his engine failed, and I watched him go down in the sea. And uh, he was in the water for about half an hour, and finally he was run over by a boat. And he was killed. The desperation I felt on his behalf was incredible. And, and it, it, it's quite a shocking thing to see, really. And uh, it distressed me for a long time. Paris information. Uh, Golf Mike Yankee, Bravo Whiskey. Uh, changing frequency to 129.825. Well, since nobody wants to talk to us, we might as well talk to each other. Um, as soon as we get to, uh, I'm aiming more or less for, uh, I think this is Cape Gris in front of us, and that's Blancnez over on our left. Uh, as soon as we get near to the French coast, we'll turn over onto La Touquet. With the coast reached and the first major obstacle behind them, there is something new to worry about. First drops of rain have run across my visor. Yeah, it looks really grim when we go straight into it. We've got to go as far again as that town on the headland sticking out there. Yeah, we're going to get wet. Coming into Latuka there, we can see... Uh, Runway straight ahead. Enjoyed that flight, Jude. Bit of a storm. Yeah, hell of a storm. Unexpected. Nice clear skies. Mind you, you could see the overcast skies when we left England, but it, we still didn't realise it was actually going to rain. Yippee! Yeah! First day. Bonjour, France! Yasmin, a Cambridge graduate, was born in Jordan. It was at university that she was first introduced to hang gliding and immediately became hooked. Even as a novice pilot, she made a tremendous impression on all she met. Soon she developed an ambition to take her newfound sport and to fly in her home country. When Yasmin became more and more ill and 
we really felt that she needed something to keep her going, something to motivate her, rather than just sit there being ill. So we thought of the idea of going London to a man. She was so excited by the whole idea that it, it just snowballed from there, really. Lots of people got involved and we had help making the brochures and so on. And, and to do it as a fundraising thing really gave her an incentive to get better, to, to keep trying, I suppose. Um, so I became involved on the organisational front and when it became obvious that Yasmin was not going to survive to see it happen, she asked us to go ahead with it anyway. But now this expedition in honour of Yasmin seems about to go wrong when it's hardly got underway. What's happened? Well, bad news, I'm afraid. Um, we've been refused permission to come into France. Uh, this is like step one and uh, we can't go any further until the paperwork's sorted out. This is the one permission that we didn't do ourselves. Everything else we've done ourselves, somebody offered to do the permission on our behalf and basically they've lost the paperwork. So. So, so what, what comes from here? Serious. Um, <laughs> if we get refused entry, they're, they're being sympathetic, or the uh, officials are being sympathetic, uh, and they're trying to fish around and work a way of getting us through. But uh, if it is refused, we have to file a flight plan to fly back. <sighs> right, well, we've been waiting for a... Paris to come back to us and then there was a phone call just a little while ago Paris has come back and uh, we're now pressing on first country we visit first paperwork problem however may I say thank you very much Pegasus aircraft of France Sort of fiddly, fiddly with all the instruments here. It's a very, very sophisticated piece of equipment. This is just to prove it. If I take my hands off, you can see we stop flying. <laughs> here we go. Go on, machine, do something silly. Am I flying with a madman? Yeah, he is flying with a madman. Oh my God! Here we go. Here we go. Now, with the fields of France passing below them. Tension gives way to an exuberance that's often apparent in the flying. Oh my god, we've got sharp men coming up on the road. Oh, we're going to go off the road, Sid. <laughs> the microlights have a fuel capacity of 45 litres with the possibility of another 45 litres carried inside panniers. Every three hours they need to land to find petrol. It also offers the opportunity to fulfil human needs and to stretch cramped legs. On avait beaucoup de choses hier. Hein? You got unloaded? Yeah. What'd you get? Diesel? Even though Judy has left half of her meagre belongings in Latouquet, there's only one place left for the French loaf. It's another long takeoff roll. The plan is to spend the night close to the German border, but first yeah, they must locate a suitable uh, airstrip. Well, we can. I, yeah, we'll take that one or the southern one. Um, or there's there's also one at um, Strasbourg, is it? or Strasbourg, uh, which is slightly south of track. The second day has brought them nearly 500 kilometers to land near the small town of Sabre Union. Tomorrow they will fly into Germany and face a landing at Nuremberg International Airport. Thank you. 
that big poser, I saw you looking, I can't see it anymore. Yeah, can see it. So we're just crossing the Rhine now, which is the border into Germany. So this is our second second frontier crossing. So it's a good feeling, it's exciting. yeah? It's a great feeling. Yeah. It's brilliant. 80 kilometres from Nuremberg, and the weather is again deteriorating. It's quite a big cold front. There's some active cells within it. There's one that's... Um, there's one that's uh, just over there and we want to go over there so hopefully we'll get to Nuremberg before it gets there. What a day for it, our first international landing. It's just pouring with rain. Helicopter out of Menschen, proceeding to Nuremberg. Uh, presently approaching Allesberg, request to enter for landing via Fox. But, uh, enter via Foxport, landing direction to 8, QN8 from 011. Landing at international airports is something microlites don't usually do, but it does have its advantages. Dwarfed by the large jets, the two microlites stand idle while the crew enjoy the luxuries of the departure lounge. When they return, the weather has improved and they're keen to be on their way. What did you get? Avgas? Yeah. There's only one sort of Avgas, it would be the same as you put in Well, I mean, the guy turns up with the bowels... Judy's microlite is proving difficult to restart. They had hoped to cross the Czech border and clear customs by nightfall, but the delay is beginning to make that look unlikely. Come on, baby, out you come. It takes over an hour of toil before the reluctant engine at last splutters to life. Once back in the air, frustration begins to subside. Their first landing at an international airport has certainly been a mixed experience. The reception we got was absolutely superb, but everything has to be done really officially, and uh, I guess as ultralights we're just not used to doing that. And they're not quite used to our way of working. But the worst thing was, we were ready to go and we got everything planned, and we had to stop because of the engine problem. So that was really frustrating. Well, since, I mean, when we start unpacking things, yeah, we need to get the tools out or something. We make the place look like a street market with uh, all our <laughs> bags all over the place, yeah. flying suits and so on. You age travellers of the sky. Yeah, I mean, walking through the terminal with your flying suit on and a map bag <laughs> under your arm. Easy it's, uh, players. It's not, we don't look like your normal traveller, I suppose. <laughs> Problems with the microlights may be solved for the moment, but the problems with the weather certainly are not. As they cross the Czech Republic towards Slovakia, the air becomes more and more turbulent. Well, it started off fairly well. We'd had a nice night's sleep and uh, seems to have gone downhill from then. As you can see behind me, the rain is raining and the clouds are cloudy. It's been very, very turbulent in places. been flying through a lot of wave rotor. Uh, it's what I'm seeing. It's, uh, it's actually a wave slot, that's why it's so rotary and rough. Twice women's hang gliding champion, Judy Ledden, has had her share of bad weather flying. But now, in a microlite, she's about to be taken completely off guard. Can't we go above it? No! Oh. No <laughs> Sorry about your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Please pass your seat. That was a hell of a thermal, that one. That one. Well, I must admit, my, uh, my, my thumb nearly went through the bottom of the trike, actually. Amazing. But the main problem is the headwind, which now slows their progress to a crawl. Sad when you can't even keep up with the larders and Skodas. They're approaching Brno on the Slovak border. Although it has a wide tarmac strip, the wind is blowing diagonally across it, and it'll take all their skill to get down safely. And by the time we got here to Bruno, the, the wind was absolutely howling. We landed diagonally across the runway. Um, it's a little bit hairy 
because it was reasonably tight and I've got no foot throttle at the moment so I was relying on poor old Gavin to have to control my speed in there which isn't immediately what I would want as in I have no control over it so uh, that was a bit hairy and then taxiing along in a howling crosswind you know, with the wing wanting to either lift or slam into the runway it was uh, all a bit traumatic really Here we go, we've just been faxed from uh, Budapest we're not a to arrive today uh, to arrive in tomorrow um, they're going to meet us at the border when we cross the border with microlites and then guide us into Ferrahegi, uh, Budapest's main international airport. So this is news as it happens. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's his answer. Answer Martin at once. Give us a face. The line of huge storm clouds between them and Hungary would have been quite capable of ripping their aircraft apart. With wings well pinned down, they can only spend the wet night in Brno and hope for better weather in the morning. Now heading further south, and with the prospect of Hungary and Romania ahead of them, they're anxious to put the bad weather that seems to have followed them across Europe behind them once and for all. Judy was noticeably shaken by the last landing, so in view of the fact that her foot throttle is still sticking open, Ben, as the more experienced pilot, agrees to swap aeroplanes until it can be fixed. However, it's strange how, once they're in the clouds, such problems are forgotten, and little things remind them of their mission, and memories of Yasmin return. The first time I saw Yasmin in hospital uh, destroyed me. I, I knew from the moment I saw her that she wouldn't survive it. The town of Estegom marks the passage into Hungary, where they'll be escorted along the river Danube by a Hungarian microlight pilot and a Cessna light aircraft. Although the rain has stopped, turbulence in the hills above them remains. But here in the Danube Valley, there's a false sense of security. As we were flying in from Czechoslovakia, we hit the most horrendous turbulence, which uh, amazingly was over flat ground. Here we are flying down the Danube in between the mountains, and it is silky smooth. <laughs> That will teach you to say it was silky smooth. It will indeed. <laughs> I just want somebody to find me a room with a bed and a warm. And a shower. A shower, clean clothes. There it is, Budapest International Airport. Ben has flown in Hungary several times before, and at Budapest International Airport, an old friend, Martin Ordodi, awaits their arrival. There are two sets of runways. These two here, which are purely for these Malev aircraft, the Malev Aircraft Company. The other two, which we've just seen an aircraft going down into, is a... It's for all the odds and sods, you know, the Jumbos, the 737s and what have you. We've actually been given Hungary's own personal airfield. At a nearby airfield the following day, the team are invited to take part in one of Hungary's biggest air shows. The Hungarians were superb. They, they came up trumped. Um, we've had to do nothing, buy nothing. Um, I mean, all we have to do is fly. They've taken care of everything else. They've contacted the Romanians. Um, they've treated us to a wonderful air show. It's, it's been superb, it's been delightful. I, I could not ask for more. Uh, hello, lady. Uh, hello, man. Let's go and fly around 
that rock. Yeah. A week in and over 2,000 kilometers behind them, the weather has finally broken. Flying above the beautiful valleys of Romania is pure pleasure. These aircraft have a two-cylinder, two-stroke engine with a capacity of 462 cc, about the size of an average motorbike engine. Engine failures are not unknown, but the aircraft's ability to glide usually makes it possible to find an emergency landing site. However, in some types of terrain, the options can be almost zero, and ahead lies just such a section. The following day, they must cross the Carpathian Mountains, the highest peaks in Romania. This is one hell of a mountain. Quite awesome. It looked uh, it looked perfectly fine from further away, but the nearer we get to it, the bigger it looks. Well, this one over here is about 8,300 feet high. And then we've got another range over there, which are about 8,500 feet high. My cylinder head temperature says six. That's far too hot. Um, drop off, drop your power now. Just glide down to the valley, just to let it cool. I can't really drop the power at the moment because the uh, the landing options are virtually, well, pretty small. Uh, well, landing options are safe. There's plenty of places to come in down there, so don't, don't worry. I can't see what. Drop off the power now, glide to the valley, leave it on tick over. Yeah. Um, if it's showing six, your cylinder head's about to blow up. Or, or the engine's about to seize. So the problem is that the rev counter stopped working on about day three. So I know that the electrics behind this dial are iffy. What does the RPM gauge say? It's not working as usual. Physically speaking, your engine can't really seize, not with all those radiators there. Oh, well, that's a relief. Seems to have flickered its way down to three now. Panic over, huh? Yeah, I just, um, because I'm so used to the rev counter not working now, I didn't even look at the cylinder head temperature. Oh. Jude, never do that to me again. Well, I can tell you I was shitting myself. I could tell you were shouting at me. I didn't need it. I'll tell you that much. Without a shadow of a doubt, today's been the best day's microlighting I've ever had. I suppose my only regret is that Yasmin isn't here to share it because she would have really loved it today. How this is Golf Mike Victor Papa Victor. I'm with. I'm the second microlight with uh, Bravo Whiskey. From Constanta, their route is planned to head directly south through Bulgaria. The flight permission has been the most difficult of all to obtain. We spent uh, 
six weeks or so trying to get permission and in the end we had to leave without permission and when we were halfway through the journey so far we managed to actually get the permission number and the paperwork sorted so now we're finally expected and we're due there at nine o'clock this morning and the wind's howling so everybody's there to meet us this whole welcoming committee and we're not going to arrive we've got a gale look out there Unlike the day before, flying becomes once more a fight against the elements, rather than a pleasure. It's quite rough, as you can see, on the bar moving about here. We've got a stick low. It's just not very pleasant flying. Unfortunately, the permission eventually received from the Bulgarian authorities allotted them an air lane 10 kilometers out into the Black Sea and forbade aerial filming. Now what's worse, they're using far too much fuel fighting the constant headwind to reach their destination. Varna approach. Uh, this is Golf Mike Yankee Bravo Whiskey. We are deviating to Belgic. Repeat, deviating to Belgic. We are short on fuel, low on fuel. Over. Right, since we actually are not supposed to film in the air in Bulgaria, we are when we're going into the airports, we're having to stow the cameras around, away so that they're not so obvious, so that we're not able to film on the ground. We're taking no chances, we couldn't get into problems, so we're just being a bit careful, so you won't actually see us landing here. Any idea what sort of reception we're going to get? I have absolutely no idea whatsoever. I would imagine what's going to happen is we'll probably be held until the police come to see our passports and to see our permission. We're off course but I don't think they will know that. It's just that we'll be coming into an airfield unannounced, a different one to the one we wanted to go to, primarily because we're short of fuel. What they, perhaps fortunately, hadn't realised was that they were landing at a military airfield. We expected to be arrested and thrown into prison. Um, uh, what happened was absolutely astonishing. The military came out, they were really bemused to see us. Uh, they made all the phone calls to the necessary chiefs and bigwigs who said, fine, just see their passports and uh, refuel them, send them on their way. Uh, we were treated to drinks in the, um, in the officers' mess. Uh, we had a lovely time basically, we were treated very, very well. And now look at this, look at the sun's out, beautiful scenery, what more could you want? And while they relaxed, the wind dropped too. Now flying conditions are excellent, and the Bulgarian coastline spectacular, and they will skirt the Black Sea all the way into Turkey. Unrestricted by cockpits, usually less than a thousand feet up, they're seeing Europe in a way that few people have seen it, or ever will see it. Look at all these fishing lines down here. Despite the bureaucracy, Bulgaria has proved less of a problem than they feared. They cross the border wondering what might await them in Turkey. This here is the northern coast of Turkey. We're not supposed to film here either, actually, but uh, it's so beautiful that uh, we feel we must, really. Ahead, Istanbul, at the crossing of the Bosphorus. Western Europe suddenly seems a long way behind them. There it is, Sid. The biggest airfield we've been in yet. <laughs> Golf Mike Yankee Bravo Whiskey. We are due west of your airfield, five kilometers. Uh, we wish landing instruction. Over. You can hear the note of uh, desperation increase. Golf Mike Yankee Bravo Whiskey is now two miles west of runway at 1,000 feet QNH 1014 and holding. Okay, confirm flying only one aircraft or uh, two aircraft? Uh, we are two aircraft. 
Well, we've been told to hold our position uh, two kilometres from the runway at a thousand feet, so we're actually orbiting in a holding pattern. <laughs> He's got us in sight, so there's two aircraft to land on this runway before us, and then we'll be cleared to land. I've done this in a 747, but I've never done it in a microlight before. Um, I will land long, land long to keep above weight turbulence. You could to land from me 18, wind to 180 degrees, 06 Go by Yankee Bravo, whiskey, Wilco, on final. 1217, goodbye. Uh, 317, wind 182 degrees, 06 knots. Golf, Bravo, Whiskey, clear of runway. Thought my knees are better. Do you want to just hide that, see? I'm not a spiritual person, I'm probably a hardened atheist in some respects, but I do feel as though there is a presence, there's uh, Yasmin spirit is, is watching over me. Uh, my mind's eye keeps conjuring up pictures of Yasmin and as Judy said, we, as soon as we heard the whaling towers I was about to tell the film crew how, how wonderful the whaling towers are, waking you up at four o'clock in the morning. Um, calling you to prayer, but the, the, the immense sensation uh, of the memories flooding back, such wonderful memories of last year in Jordan with Yasmin, were, were just too much for me. I actually really enjoyed it. It was wonderful. It's a really experience and I wouldn't have missed it for the world. It was soured a bit by people just demanding money for landing fees and handling fees just as though we were a jumbo. Um, but, you know, all profits from this venture are going to the cancer research campaign and I think we paid more during the 12 hours that we were in Istanbul than we did for the whole trip so far. The only places they have official permission to land are Istanbul and Ankara. But what seems to escape the authorities is that their range without refueling is half of that distance. Fortunately, they can carry the necessary fuel in panniers. Well, I saw the rubber burning there. And all the smoke Gavin, coming out. Flick We've got some flick flick the thousands of motorcyclists and bikes. Sorry, I've got it. Thank you. Oh. I thought we'd never get a bloody stop. It's Judy's first ever landing on a rough track, and the throttle is sticking again. Hello. Hello. You speak English? English. English. A little. Yeah. How much for Hello. landing charges? Hello there. Hello. Very Hello. beautiful horses. Hi. Ah, yeah, very good. Yeah, very nice. Up. Very good. Up. Oh, there. Yeah. Good. 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 Even though the Turkish authorities didn't want us to do this, uh, when I told them this was the only way we were going to do it, uh, I said they'll have to give us at least one grey area in their rules. <laughs> and, uh, they smiled. Come from um, Istanbul. Istanbul to Ankara. Uh, Istanbul, Ankara. But um, 
not much benzene. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks. It's small tanks. These three guys that you see on the track where we've just landed uh, put to shame the whole of the Turkish airport. Oh, there's only two there now. Never mind. These three guys came over to us after we'd landed. Uh, they were pleased to greet us, full of big grins, offered us tea, offered to take us back to their houses, to be guests of their houses. Uh, it's, that is quite typical of microlighting, flying microlights in uh, foreign countries. In Ankara, as everywhere, the people around the airport are helpful but the authorities still treat them as though they're jet aircraft. We'd put on our flight plan that we're flying from uh, Ankara to Ad Adana and we're flying in a straight line. And the powers to be said, no, we can't do that. We've got to fly along their airway. Knowing their airway, their airway goes the direct route from Ankara to Adana. So, okay, fine, I said. And then they came back and said, no, and you can't fly it at 1,000 feet. You've got to fly it at flight level 135, which is 13,500 feet. And I just sort of said, OK, that's fine. <laughs> we'll do it. Um, there's absolutely no way we can do that. Yeah, I found a cup of coffee. Uh, let's go and give it a go then, for a giggle. Make sure it's a cafe first as well. What do you think? Has that got a cafe or not? Doesn't have a Coca-Cola sign. What about this one beneath you? There's a restaurant, looking good. It's got wires just in front of it though. A convenient track next to the road will make a perfect runway. Easy peasy. It can't be often that two microlights drop in for dinner, but neither the restaurant owner nor the guests seem particularly phased by the unscheduled visit. Even so, the prices seem to have doubled. Now don't forget to drive on the right side this time, Ben. Pilots, crew and machines refueled, it's time to go, but preferably not by road. Yes, people, this is a road. This is not a runway. On to our private road, our private airstrip. Aircraft crossing. <laughs> he ducked. Shit! <laughs> What's that? Turbulence in. <laughs> it could have been serious, but ahead are the Taurus Mountains, and the turbulence there could be twice as bad. This 2,000 metre pass presents the most dangerous physical obstacle in the whole trip. 10 to 6. Thermals will be dying won't be so strong. It's just winds in mountains like this and the dodging. The conditions are in fact as yeah, good as they could hope for, but they know with the weight they carry that the pass is at the altitude limit of their aircraft and that gives almost no room for maneuver. Yeah, I'm a little bit intimidated, hence the, uh, the crappiness. Just, um, yeah, sort of, uh, I'm giving this place a lot of respect. What they do know is that mountain air can be full of surprises. No, don't do that, Sid. That was quite terrifying. It's the worst bounces we've been in all trip, even Czechoslovakia. I'm not worried by the mountain pass. I know what was causing that. That was three valleys meeting, and it was all rotor and convergence and everything else. It was just very evil air, low down. It was just the valley winds mixing. Then I'm going to have to turn back, I'm not climbing, I'm just going to turn around and do a beat. Keep coming Jude, I think you'll be alright from there. 
flat ground um, over this little rise, over the bridge it goes flat. We're trying to climb over this pass. I'm, I'm on absolute flat out power with the bar stuffed out. The other out. thing is the wind also changes direction up here, the uh, headwind disappears. And we're not climbing at all. That was really, really close. I thought I was going to have to turn back into the gully and uh, do a bit more climbing. But I mean, when you're only doing 100 feet a minute, if that, it just wasn't climbing fast enough to get over the path. And the road's rising up for more than 100 feet a minute. Yeah, I was looking the lorry drivers in the eye for a while there. That was really, really close, Ben. I was looking eyeball to eyeball with the truck drivers. I bet they thought you were being really nice and kind, giving them a good view. Well, good news is it's downhill all the way to the sea from now on. Well, I personally was more than a little concerned about going into, uh, into that valley and having a look at how, how fast the ground was rising and how slow we were climbing, it was getting a little bit nerve wracking. Well, I was certainly nervous going into it as well, because you can't ever tell with mountains. You can judge according to what you know. And I, know, I do know quite a bit about flying in mountains, because I've done a lot of it. But it can always surprise you, and that's the scary thing, really. I admit, I was terrified through that gap. That was probably the most scariest thing I've done in microlights. I've flown them upside down, I've flo flown them underneath bridges underneath telegraph poles, uh, all sorts of pranks. But coming through that mountain pass, that, uh, that made me feel about that big. <laughs> I'm saying <trying> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you squealed, Sid, and grabbed my shoulders a couple of times. <laughs> well, that's true. That is true, Ben. That was just affection. Now, with a relatively easy cruise down to Adana, Turkey is almost behind them. And Jordan, Yasmin's home country, seems almost within reach. Only three months ago, Yasmin was still alive. I had this feeling or this thought that wouldn't it be nice to, if Yasmin could fly just one more time, so could I? <laughs> Do you really think I could? Yes, please, I would love to. I'll probably be able to tuck it down my jacket and then you can twiddle it from, if, the, if that's up there. The day that we finally went out to go and fly was the most idyllic day you could possibly imagine. And at all times, Yasmin was immensely calm, uh, hugely joyous. There was no wind. Uh, there was ethereal clouds with sort of a very low cloud base. Uh, there was a good vertical height to them, so it allowed us to be able to fly around and amongst and inside these clouds uh, giving a angelic quality to the flight. Yasmin was sitting bolt upright. Her eyes were as big as saucers. She was very, very alert, but more than anything else, she was over the moon. Ten days later, Yasmin Saudi was dead. She was 25 years old. Ahead now, only Syria stands between them and Jordan. But first, let's get out of Turkey. Uh, Golf Mike, Yankee, Bravo, Whiskey. We have clearance to fly into Syria. We have clearance which was obtained by King Hussein of Jordan. We cannot read you the clearance number now because we are flying at microlights. We have no cockpit. Uh, we will gladly give you the clearance number when we land. Over. Wamar, هذا مفتوح الطاقة من فوق من عنده. إذا كان بدي رالك يا بطير من الوراء. أشوفه في ال 115 One thing worrying is they ask for the clearance number. If if this guy was going to be a little bit officious. Uh, it might have got a bit worrying. We might have had uh, an aircraft or two come up and join us, or maybe some uh, unmanned type of aircraft. <laughs> there is always that worry. However, 
uh, we've managed to talk the guy into accepting that we're coming in. Yeah, I was just saying, just saying to Ben that this is one of the uh, landings that we're definitely not going to film. We don't know what sort of reception video cameras are get here. So we're going to uh, put it out of sight while we land. And uh, we'll tell you about it later. The authorities in Aleppo were highly inefficient. It took three hours to clear passport control, but at least on the surface they seemed friendly. It does get a bit frustrating at times. They don't seem to understand that we have to, you know, we have a, a mission as it were and we've got to rush. However, we're here, we're in the air. Yeah. Uh, we're on our way, so. But actually, I, if you waited long enough, they are quite helpful. Yes, they are. Um, I have to confess I misunderstood them. I thought it was people just being officious. Um, and then as I discovered later on, they, they weren't. They were being genuinely helpful. Nevertheless, they're only officially allowed two landing places in Syria, Aleppo and Damascus. And again, the distance between them is more than they can manage on one tank of fuel. However, Ben has realized that to argue could mean they won't be allowed to continue. We need to find a little road somewhere, just go down, put the rest of the fuel in. Uh, that'll avoid having to climb out into thermic air uh, later on. A narrow road, as remote as possible, is chosen to refuel. But people have a habit of arriving from nowhere. With luck, the police won't be among them. It's a little bit tight. You will have to be very accurate on this, Jude. Sure. Okay. The ordinary people, as ever, are friendly. The desert below is beautiful, but the atmosphere is tense and it's not helped by what they see. Lots of missiles below us. Even so, that night in Damascus, the thoughts understandably are not of Syria, but of Amman, the end of their journey, and Yasmin's hometown, where all being well, they will arrive the next day. It is going to be a day of very mixed emotions tomorrow. Um, I think that we both really felt it very acutely today that it was the last but one flight. Certainly for me yesterday, coming into an Arabic country where the writing's an Arabic script and we're eating hummus and pita bread and all the things that we ate in Jordan, it brought back a lot of memories. And today was certainly, I mean, we're both quite tense in the air and uh, we've talked about it since, and I think we're both, the emotions are running pretty high. I am very uh, sort of emotional about this, as uh, the awareness of uh, letting go of Yasmin, and Yasmin's spirits becoming greater. Uh, I've been driving ahead with this project now for a long time with Yasmin, and without Yasmin, when Yasmin passed away, it has been a, um, a goal of mine to achieve. Uh, when it's finished, I believe that it will be my parting gesture to Yasmin, and that hurts me a lot. What happens next morning is told by Ben's cartoons. 
At the airport, the Syrians have found out about the unauthorized landing and virtually accuse them of spying. Ben says they had engine problems. Although they're finally released, they're then routed via an air lane that goes off into the desert and will leave them without enough fuel to reach the border. Without choice, they drop to 50 feet, and much to the confusion of the air traffic controller, they disappear from radar. There follows a tense, unfilmed, two-hour flight all the time watching out for missile bases until they finally reach the Jordanian border. Once we'd contacted Amman airfield um, and sighted the border, the tension all disappeared and uh, the jubilation we had crossing the border was, was tremendous. We just now landed at King Hussein's airfield because we needed new fourth fuel. Uh, we've refueled and we're now on our way into Amman. Brilliant. With the goal in sight, emotions start to build, heightened by the tensions of the last few hours. Trying to keep the model in a straight line is just about all I can do. Could you check the hand throttles off, please? Hand throttle? Just flip it, switch it right off. Yeah, it's a right off. Thank you. Golf Bravo, Whiskey and Man Tower, we are now at 4,500 feet. Golf Bravo, Whiskey, Roger, continue up to report standard. Look at this! We've got people lined up. Wow. Well, there's down there. Yeah. 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 Bravo Whiskey, clear to land, taxiway number 12608, Gatling 17. Bravo Whiskey, welcome. Gulf Papa Victor on short time, taxiway 1. Victor Papa Victor, clear to land as number 2 and taxiway number 12608. Gulf Papa Victor, clear to land. Let's put her down, Ben. There she goes. But Yasmin has the last joke. Judy's throttle is about to stick open one more time. Golf Bravo Whiskey, taxiing to keep out of way of Golf Papa Victor. <laughs> I can't do anything. Come on, I can't uh, Bravo do Whiskey, I'm man, maintain your position for a while. Uh, Golf Bravo Whiskey, we'll go. Have to cut the engine, I think. Now, without an engine, Gavin will have to push Spirit of Yasmin to where Prince Rad and television cameras await their arrival. <laughs> the last hundred yards, we have to push. Fancy having to push you the last hundred yards. Sorry here, Man Tower. Um, we, <laughs> we have an engine problem. After all this way, we have an engine problem on Golf Mike, Victor, Papa, Victor. Ben and Judy arrived in Amman, ending a two-week marathon flight from England to Jordan to raise awareness about cancer and money for research. They traveled across nine countries in their ultralight aircraft, withstanding over 4,000 kilometers of unpredictable challenges and weather. But nothing could have prepared them for the emotions they would encounter on their final landing. They had completed their journey, reached their destination, and met their goal, to fly the distance as a tribute to Yasmin. With the help of friends, colleagues, and sponsors, Ben and Judy plan to continue filming the trip throughout their two-week stay in Jordan with flights over the Nabataean city of Petra, the Roman city of Jerash, and Wadi Ram, known as Valley of the Moon. With all their flying years, the two hang gliding champions say this trip was the most important. The most overwhelming feeling getting here was relief. I think there were so many things that could have gone wrong and some of them did, but they were all rectifiable at the time. It was such an incredible experience, such a wealth of experiences all in one. Uh, feelings in, just indescribable relief at having got here. I, I am extremely proud in what's happened with uh, uh, and what the team of Flight for Life have done. 
Uh, I couldn't ask for more. Over the following two weeks, Ben and Judy will proudly bring their little aircraft to the dramatic landscapes and to the people of Jordan. Mm -hmm.